By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And as you can see, we are going to look at a duel between a mono green combat tricks deck versus a red and white dragons deck. Now, before I'm going to go to the deck deck section, I would just like to point out that you can also go to the games straight away if you want to. So you can skip the deck tech. I know that some of you enjoy um, listening to the deck tech at the end of the match or just skip it all together. So you can do that by checking the description below. There you will find timestamps. One of those timestamps says MTG Games. Click on the timestamp and that will take you directly to the action. Now here we are going to continue with the deck deck and I think I'm first gonna zoom in into the mono green deck that's piloted by Richard. Let's take a look. And this is the deck that Richard is playing today and you can find him on Instagram on oldschoolmtg underscore NL. By the way, if you'd like to see more old school content, it's pretty sweet Instagram account. Well, he's playing today with this mono green combat tricks deck and um, well, I don't really think I have to explain why it's called that way, right? You've got three Pendle Havens that can pump up most of the creatures in this deck as the majority is just 1-1 one, one creatures. You've got your Giant Growth that you can use during combat. You've got your White Lulu Wolves that you can use to pump creatures to a 2-2. Two, two. Now, um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to is seeing the card Tracker in action. So Tracker is a card from the dark. One green and two to cast for a 2-2. Two, two. And for two green and tap, it tracks target creature for you. So it tracks a creature of the opponent. And then it deals damage to that creature equal to the power of the tracker, but it also gets damage back equal to the power of the creature that it's tracking. So, for example, the tracker is now a 2-2, right? If I would use to track down one of those mighty Sheevan dragons of his opponent, Hank, the tracker will die. But if I put a giant growth on there, I'm going to trade the tracker for the dragon. And it gets even better. If I pump it with my White Lowly Wolf, my tracker becomes... Uh, a 6-6, six, six. so it will actually kill the Sheevan Dragon, unless, of course, the opponent has one red open. But you can kind of understand where I'm going uh, to with this deck. There are just a lot of tricks. You start with really small creatures, and then you pump them up in all sorts of different ways. And obviously, when you look at this deck, this is really a quick deck. It just wants to finish the job as quickly as possible, using the tracker to maybe kill the small threats that could possibly block something. Also, the Spitting Slug, of course, has um, has a nice trick where you can uh, pay a green and a colorless and give it the first strike. That works very well with the Giant Groves. Talking about first strike, the Elvish Archers in this deck. I mean, just a beautiful creature, the Elvish Archer. Also gets a lot better with the Giant Grove on it because of that first strike ability. Can you imagine uh, a scenario where the Elvish Archer attacks and, you know, the opponent blocks it on a Sheevan and then Richard responds by playing a Giant Grove on the archer, and the archer will just kill the Sheevan Dragon, and the archer will live because of that first strike ability. So that's going to be really interesting to kind of see duels like that, and I also think the Wailuli Wolf could be quite important here in combination with the Pendlehaven. Remember, um, for example, Script Sprites is a 1-1 flyer with a Pendlehaven, I can make it into a 2-3, and with Wailuli Wolf, I can make it into a 3-4 flying creature. So, I mean, that's pretty good, right, for just one green. Obviously, you've got to tap a lot of resources to get there, but still, the idea, it's, it's pretty sweet. So, this is the deck of Richard. I'm just expecting him to want to finish this match as quickly as he possibly can. Let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Hank. And this is the deck that Hank is playing. Um, he's playing red and, well, I, I've called it red and white dragons. Um, I know that there's also an Atlantic um, variant of this deck playing with the Org. You know, that's O-R-G-G, -G, and that's, of course, the great creature from Fallen Empires, the 6-6 six, six Trampler. Um, now, this is uh, this game is played according to the Swedish rules, so there's no Fallen Empires in here. If you'd like to know more about the rule set, by the way, you can check the description below. And there, I usually post the rule set. Sometimes I forget it. You know, I'm, I'm worried at, what, 200-something videos on the channel, and, you know, I forget something from time to time, but... If you like to know the rule set, it's usually in the description below. So let's take a look at this deck. The first thing I'd like to point out is that there's one single beautiful fire elemental in this brew, but I believe that Hank is actually testing out Dragon Whelp. So he's changed the fire elemental for the Dragon Whelp. And, you know, there, there are things to say to support that choice, and there are things to say 
to you know to say okay fire elemental is the better option i think fire elemental for five mana you get five power which is really really good um and the art is amazing then again dragon whelp is pretty cool art too and it is a flyer and flyer of course it's great evasion but you do pay four mana and you only get two power in return of course you can pump it with red mana um so i guess you kind of have to see how often you know, are you able to really pump the Dragon Whelp and how often is the flying relevant? And uh, if the answer on both those questions is all the time, then, you know, Dragon Whelp is your number one pick. But I also think that, you know, Fire Elemental is a very interesting option as well and you don't see it as often in play. So that would be my personal favorite, but I've never played with this deck before. So let's just see how Dragon Whelp will do in this matchup. So I'm gonna keep a special eye on Dragon Whelp also, if you'd like to share your opinion about this, what would you play in this specific deck? Would you play Dragon Whelp over Fire Elemental or would you keep the Fire Elemental in this deck? Now, let's take a look. I've called it Red and White Dragons, but actually it's more of a red deck when you look at the first 60 cards because there's only one white card in here and that is Balance. So let's first focus on the color red. I kind of see two strategies here because I'm seeing those three Atox at the top on the left top corner and that means oh it's an atop deck so we're going to see black vice we're going to see ank of mistra we're going to see well actually you're not seeing those creatures right so it is a different take on atok atok has a different less dominant role in this deck it's still really good because you're playing with mana vaults you're playing with a lot of artifacts in this deck you're playing with the jewelry the moxen which is you know a plus two plus two for zero mana when you're playing with an atok right so um, it's got a lot of components of the Atok deck, but what I like about it is that you're playing with Atok as kind of a side plan, and your main plan are probably the four Sheevan Dragons, playing the big Sheevans, mighty 5-5 five, five flyer powerhouse house, iconic card of old school, and um, your opponent will have, uh, probably will have problems with having to face Atok and having to face Sheevan Dragon in the same deck, because what are you going to do with your creature removal? Are you going to focus on Atok? Are you going to focus on Sheevan Dragon? And what if you just kill the Sheevan and then all of a sudden there's an Atok on the board and there are tons of artifacts in play as well? And you're thinking as the opponent, oh, I should have waited. Um, and vice versa, of course. What if there's an early Atok um, as, as the opponent, you quickly kill the Atok and then all of a sudden there's a Sheevan Dragon in turn three or turn four. You know, there's, there's a lot of ramp in this deck. So that is definitely possible and then there's also the sideboard strategy of this deck and that's maybe the reason why i've called it red and white instead of just red um, there is a lot of white in the sideboard and the white cards are interesting to say the least because one of the things that happens when you're playing with a red deck is that your opponent if if he or she is able to will board in circle of protection red now there are three nice sarah angels that can work around that circle of protection. Another thing that can happen is that your opponent sees an Atok in game one, has all the alarm bells ringing, is gonna board in a lot of artifact hate, and, and there you go with your Atok strategy, it no longer works. Well, one of the things that you can do against that is you can board out your three Atoks, board in your three Seras, board in your two Motes, and, and create and turn it into, I should say, a Flyers deck, so go from an Atok Shivan deck into an, a Flyers only deck, you know, with your with your modes to protect you on the ground. So that's also a very interesting strategy. So I like, one of the things I like most about this deck is actually the sideboard and the options that the sideboard gives you. Now looking at this deck and looking at the Green Combat Tricks deck, I think, you know, what, what Green Combat wants to do is really quickly finish the game um, and probably use those trackers to kill the Atok before there are any artifacts or too many artifacts in the game. And I think what Hank will probably wants to do is, you know, extend the game a little bit, go to mid game. Of course, he can ramp into, you know, really big creatures like a Sheevan or his uh, a Dragon Whelp early in the game. But he's probably more want to take the game towards mid game than his opponent will, I think. And, you know, looking at this deck, I, I think Hank is a favorite in this matchup, just looking at the sheer power of his cards in his deck. But we'll just have to see. Let's go to game one and find out. Game number one. And on the left, we have Richard. And on the right, we have Hank. So he's actually playing on the Timmy playmat. I believe it is Richard on the play here. So that's a good for him because he's got a pretty quick deck. Okay, I guess I was wrong. It's actually Hank on the play. Kind of hard to see with the glare there. I think it's a Badlands, and there is a Lanora Elves turn one by Richard. 
Now let's see what Hank can do here. It's not the best camera quality. Uh, this, that is a volcanic island. Some glare on those dual lands there. But I still wanted to show. And what is he doing? And he's playing a demonic tutor. So probably going to look up an ancestral recall here. Of course, I don't know what's in his hand. So maybe he's going to look up something else. But it is the obvious choice. But the obvious choice is not always the best choice. And he's going through his deck. So it looks like... Is he going to pick it? Yes or no? We'll find out shortly. And the camera is shaking slightly. And this game was recorded quite a while ago. And I kind of found it back on my hard drive and thought, hey, this is a cool game. Let's make a match video out of this one. There's the second four. So he could play, for example, a tracker. Probably would prefer to put some pressure on the board. You're having three mana. Maybe an Ice Storm. That could be an option as well. Taking away, for example, his blue mana. Targeting that volcanic island. Tapping three here. Will we see an Ice Storm? And there is an Ice Storm. And that's exactly what he's doing. Taking out the blue. Maybe expected an ancestral recall here from Hank. So I guess he didn't look that up with the Demonic Tutor. Now that is interesting. Playing a second Badlands, tapping four. And oh, a mind twist. Did he look up a mind twist? That is probably the best play, but ugh, yuck. So there we see T-Shirt shuffling up. And he's going to lose three cards in total. At least that Ice Storm saved him one card. Ay, 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 Sylvan Library. That is pretty brutal. Sylvan could have gotten him back. After losing that many cards, there is a Mishra's Factory. That's not too bad, actually. And tapping... Is he tapping three here? Oh, he's attacking with the Lunar Elf, of course, and then casting the Elvish Archer. And there we see Hank dropping down to 19. Elvish Archer on the board. And there is a Mishra's Factory from Hank. Is he going to cast something big? No, he's not. He's just passing turn. Doesn't have enough mana yet for a Sheevan Dragon. And let's see what he's gonna, going to do. Is he going to animate his Mishra's Factory? I think he is. And he's going to attack with the Elfish Archer and the Mishra's Factory. Now remember, the Mishra's Factory of Hank still has Summoning Sickness. So he couldn't block and pump it. So that's why he's taking the damage. Oh, don't put the dice all the way over there. Now we can't see your life anymore. Uh, okay, I think he's on... 15, I believe, because he took 4 damage and 1 damage earlier from the Lanarel. So he's on 15, and there's the Wailuli Wolf. So green creature, 1-1 one, one from Arabian Nights. You can tap it to give any other creature plus 1, plus 1. It looks like Hank is going to read it now. It's a pretty sweet creature. I, I really like playing it in combination with Juggernaut. If you can make Juggernaut into a 6-4, it's just so much more powerful, and it's out of bolt range. And there's another... Mishra's Factory, are we going to see a Sheevan Dragon now? Even if he doesn't cast a Sheevan, the Mishra's Factory is alone or pretty problematic for Richard here. And it looks like he's just tapping everything. I'm expecting a Sheevan here. Oh, a Fireball! <laughs> oh, that's brutal! Playing a Fireball for six, that means he can deal one damage to each target. And this is a beautiful three for one for Hank here. And of course, this is uh, one of the things that makes the green strategy weak, is that they all have one toughness. But now we see a bigger creature, 2-4, spitting slug from the dark, hitting the board. But things are looking pretty bad here for Hank, you know, first, the or for, for Richard, sorry, first the uh, Mind Twist. And are we going to see a Shiva now? And there is the Shiva Dragon. First the Mind Twist, then the Fireball, now the Sheevan. Oh, I think it's uh, it's pretty much over and done with here for this game at least. Attacking with both, probably having or pretending to have a Giant Growth in hand. And the question is, is Hank just going to take the damage or is he going to take, the, take a risk? That is the question here. It looks like he's just taking the damage. He's going down to 11. 
taking four damage here and next turn he can swing in for tons of damage i do believe that hank is still on 20 so he can take some damage he's not dead yet is he going to animate those two mistress factories remember there are batlands in the corner of his playmat that we can't see right now attacking with the 5-5 flyer so that means he's going to take this 5 damage. Is he going to pump it up? He can make it into a 7-5. That's exactly what he's doing. That means he's going to drop down to 13. Actually, we're going to see him drop down to 12. Apparently, he took a damage somewhere along the way. But he's on... At least he's on 12, it seems. Taking his turn. And it's going to be difficult. I mean, the, the thing is with the green deck, it is really strong when it can put pressure on, but it's not really good in defending, obviously. So this Sheevan is a big problem. It doesn't have any any good removal in the deck. And animating both the factories is going to probably block with both here and just take the risk. You know, he's saying, you know, Richard, if you have a giant grove, show it. And there is one giant grove. And interestingly enough, Oh, he was double blocking the spitting slug. Oh, that's what happened. He double blocked the spitting slug. And I do believe that means that he will have to... Oh, first strike doesn't, doesn't matter much. Doesn't matter much. Does it? I believe what happens here with spitting slug is kind of a weird creature. It's from the dark and you've got to pay one green and one or else the creatures of your opponent have first strike. And when you uh, pay one green and one, spitting slug is first strike. I think what happened here is Hank double blocked the spitting slug and pumped the Mistress Factory. So it was two Mistress Factories that represents six power and six toughness blocking the two for spitting slug, but the two for spitting slug got a giant growth making it a five seven creature so first it took the six damage from the factories and it was still alive and then it dealt five damage back to the factories meaning it killed one of the factories and the other mistress factory went through and dealt damage and that means that i believe hank right now is actually on nine i think they're having a little discussion if he took the damage he's actually now taking i believe extra damage again i could be wrong here but anyway he's dropping to seven And um, that is making it pretty interesting because now if Hank decides to swing in with a Shivan, he cannot use it as a blocker, obviously. And also that um, Scavenger Folk is actually pretty relevant because Scavenger Folk can destroy an artifact. And Mishra's Factory, of course, becomes an artifact creature. There we see a Chaos Orb. Perhaps he's actually going to flip on the scavenger folk. Because if he flips on the scavenger folk, he can keep his mistress factory as a blocker. I wonder what he's going to do. Or maybe the spitting slug. Okay, he's going to go for the spitting slug. Maybe I would have gone for the scavenger folk. And it looks like it's a hit. So the spitting slug is a goner. What is he going to do next? It looks like he is going to swing in. Swing in for at least 5 damage. He can make it into 7 if he wants to. Doesn't do it. I think that's a good decision. Keeping his mana open. He's got 2 Batlands there in the corner, I believe. And he's got a Mishra's Factory still. Passing turn here. So, Richard's on 7. And I believe Hank is on 7 now as well. It is a little bit annoying, of course, because we cannot see the scores. And, oh, look at that. He's picking up the cards. He's saying, nope, you've got this one. I can't deal that last seven points of damage. And that means that Hank is winning this first game. Game number two. And um, let's see if Richard can, uh, can do something here in the second game. I guess that first game was pretty brutal. And um, let's take a look. Are they still going to change their life totals there? It looks like it. So Richard, of course, going back to 20 and Hank going back to 20. Unfortunately, we cannot see the life total of Hank. So I'll kind of try to keep you up to date as we go along in this second game. There is a plateau into a mana vault. 
So that's a pretty decent start for Henk, especially since we didn't see um, anything else but a forced for turn one for Richard. But look at this here, taking care of both of the permanents on the board of Hank. That does mean that Hank gains one life from the crumble, going to 21. So we saw a strip mine on the plateau and then a crumble on the mana vault. There is a city of brass here. And there's a second green in the form of a Pendlehaven. And there is the Whirling Dervish, the card from Legends. And remember, when it attacks, it's a 1-1, one, one, but every time it deals damage, it actually gets a plus one, plus one counter. Oh, there's a quick lightning bolt. And I think that's a very good response because before you know it, it'll grow bigger and bigger and bigger. It does mean one damage for Hank. He's going to go to 20. So both players on 20 at the moment. Let's see what Hank can do. Oh, he's just passing turn. No land for Hank. This means opportunity here. For Richard, he's tapping three down. What is he going to do with the mana? Sylvan Library, that is very good. Also playing, of course, a lot of our elves' mana dork. This is very good here for Richard. Next turn, he can swing in for four. Or, of course, he can play out even more threats. Is there a land for Hank? There's no land again. And that's very dangerous against these aggressive decks. Looks like Richard is forgetting his Sylvan here. What is he going to do? He's going to animate the factory, attacking and probably pumping it with Pendlehaven, dealing four damage in total. And that means that Hank's going to drop to 16, I believe. So Hank is on 16 right now. And also playing a Scavenger Folk. And a Scavenger Folk can be quite interesting because it can use it to get rid of, for example, that Mox there. Oh, balance! That single balance in Hank's deck, is that the thing that's going to get him back into the game? Wow, wow, wow. He is taking a damage from his own City of Brass. going to drop down to 15, but look at this. The only downside for Hank is that he's losing so many cards in his hand. Look at that. Five cards gone out of Hank's hand. Only one left. And, of course, Richard still has the Sylvan Library, and he's got 20 life, so he can probably build up a pretty strong hand again pretty quickly. Look at this, taking all the cards there, going to 12, playing that forest. There is a crumble, aye. And this is bad news. And I don't think he gains any life from the crumble. I'm not sure what he did there with his life total. I believe he's still on 15, taking his second card passing turn here. And things are just looking great actually for Richard. Taking another extra card, going to drop down to 8 here. I believe at least. It's 8, right? Yeah, it's 8. And things are just looking great for Richard just because of that Sylvan. That Sylvan stayed in play, and that's kind of what's saving the game here for Richard and what's still giving him the edge here. And Hank just needs lands. He needs lands. There's a Mace of If and a Wailuli Wolf. And with that wolf, he can continue putting on pressure on Hank's life total, who's still pretty high up. I mean, he's still on 15. Passing turn here. Looking at the first three cards because of the Sylvan. Probably not going to take anything extra now because he's already on eight. He's got to be careful. Still playing against a red deck. And attacking now with the Wailuli Wolf. There's a tap. Going to go down to 14. Playing a Lightning Bolt. Is that the end of the wolf? Pumping it up. Wow, and a giant grove. That means the Wailulu Wolf with the pump of the Pendlehaven turns into, I believe, a 5-6. That means 5 damage, 6 damage because of that City of Brass as well. That means that Hank is going to drop to 9. Finding a Mox Emerald here. And having to pass turn. He is on 9. He's already below 10. Richard is probably going to pick Pure Gas. Let's see what he's going to do here. Crumble again. I mean, those crumbles have been extremely strong against the uh, the mana base of Hank playing with the mana vaults and the moxen. There's an attack. Probably going to pump with the wolf, I assume. And he's actually not pumping with the wolf. Taking one damage. Going to go down to eight. And now playing an elvish archer. So he's still on eight. I mean, if he can... At least find a land. Start with playing out another land. And Atok also would, well, not really help, but at least it would be a blocker. 
another bolt would be great here because Richard is tapped out so he can use a bolt to kill one of the creatures if he has one I believe he's already played out like two or three bolts so chances are very slim that there's a third or fourth bolt in his hand now only two cards there for Hank what can he do Black Lotus, cracking the Lotus there. I kind of missed him playing out that Lotus, by the way. Taking another damage. Going to go down to 7. Playing that Demonic Tutor, or is he going to go down to 8? Anyway, playing the Demonic Tutor. He's got 2 mana floating, of course. What is he going to do? Ancestral Recall. Okay, that's going to fill his hand. Probably giving him a land. And he didn't have a land drop yet. And then he still has... One blue floating, I guess, plus the land, maybe being able to cast something else. Even a fireball for one would help him now, at least taking care of one of the two creatures. But um, things are looking grim for Hank here. He's on eight or on seven, one of the two, and he's in trouble. His opponent, Richard, is on eight. And that is because of all the activations of the Sylvan Library. Looks like they're discussing a thing or two here. And the tutor is going to go into the bin. And he's probably going to play out the Ancestral. Still having the mana floating. Drawing three cards. Let's see what he can pick up. And he's just passing turn. No lands here for Hank. That is pretty brutal. Not finding anything of use in those three cards from the Ancestral Recall. And there is a Mistress Factory attacking here. Pumping up one of the creatures. And dealing four damage in total. That means that he's now on, I believe, four life. Four measly life. Finally finding a land there. There's a plateau, but I think it's too late, to be honest. Gonna go to three here. Taking a damage... From the City of Brass, there's an Atok now on the board. And I think if he swings in with everything, it is pretty much over. And that means it's 1-1 one, one, and we're going to go to a... Oh, he doesn't even need to attack. There is a Hurricane. And that means that Green Combat Tricks is taking the second game. That means we are going to an all-decisive game number three. Game number three. So it's 1-1 one, one, and it is Hank on the play, the player with the... Uh, Red and white, I guess, Sheevan Dragon deck. Nice to see both dice clearly on the screen so we can follow the life totals. And uh, let's see, I believe Hank is on the play, right? Because he lost that second game. Opening with a Mox Jet and a Plateau. There is a Forest. Mox Emerald. And Lana Were Elves and a Scripps Sprites. And here's the aggressive start actually off this green deck that I haven't really seen in the first two games but that I have been expecting so it's nice to see that in game number uh, three happening there's a quick lightning bolt in response by Hank here playing out a second duel I believe that's a bad lance a bit hard to see with the glare and there is a pendle haven that means that he can now attack for three or of course play out some more threats an ice storm would be interesting as well Looks like he's attacking for two here, bringing Hank to 18, tapping two to play an Elvish Archer, and passing turn. And there is a Shatter on the Mox. And a Lightning Bolt on the Archer. And no land drop by Hank. Again, problems with lands. Remember, he lost game two because he just couldn't find any lands. Gonna go to 16, there's another Scripps Sprites, more pressure on the board. And although Hank did a pretty good job in kind of killing some creatures, he does need lands here. Let's see what he can do. Tapping his Plateau and his Mox Jet, playing a Chaos Orb. Yeah, perhaps the best thing to flip on would have been the Pendle Haven. On the other hand, maybe it's a better decision to kind of keep your orb. And um, 
He's going to take three damage here. He's going to drop 13. Because remember that Pendlehaven can pump his 1 1 creatures with plus 1 plus 2. There's a White Lily Wolf. I wonder, and you can see that Hank is kind of contemplating am I going to use my orb at the end step? Perhaps that White Lily Wolf would have been an interesting target playing a mana vault here. That means that next turn when he can untap, he'll have six mana. And there is a balance again, and we saw balance in game two. And this is a pretty brutal balance, because remember, um, balance doesn't care about all the artifacts in play. So we see three artifacts on the side of Hank. They don't really count. It looks at lands, creatures, and hand size, playing a giant growth over one of the creatures just to empty his hand, make sure that Hank will have to empty his hand as well, losing a Blood Moon and a Shatter. You might wonder why play a Blood Moon against a mono deck. Well, you want to take care of those Pendle Havens, right? And Blood Moon will do that for you. Very interesting situation now in game number three. There is a Volcanic Island and Hank has nothing on hand. Only one card in hand for Richard passing turn. They're playing a Scripps Rites. And he's going to go for the Pendlehaven. And I think that's a good decision. And it is a hit. I think that's a very good decision because Pendlehaven can pump almost every creature in Richard's deck. And also it means that he's going to lose a land and he's left with a one lander. Attacking here with the sprites. And there we saw a quick Black Lotus used to cast the Elvish Archer 2-1 first striker. And let's see, it looks like Hank wants to cast something big. Will we see another Sheevan Dragon? Yes, there's another Sheevan. Tap that Mana Vault there in the corner of his desk. 5-5 five, five Flyer now. And is he going to untap his Mana Vault? That's a, that's a big question here. And it looks like he's going to do that here, trying to select the right mana to do this. So tapping four to untap the Mana Vault and drawing a card for turn. Now it's still pretty difficult here for Hank because Richard can just use his Crypt Sprites as jump blockers. And that's probably the reason why Hank is not attacking right now. Passing turn, having all his mana available again. And this is looking really, really good for Hank here. Look at all the mana he has when you compare that to his opponent, Richard. And Richard has more creatures, but they're all very tiny. And there we see the Dragon Whelp that we discussed in the deck tech. 2-3 Flyer that you can pump. And now I'm actually quite surprised that he's not attacking with his Sheevan. I mean, he's still on 12. He still has a lot of life. He could just swing in, and then he still has a Dragon Whelp as a blocker. Maybe he missed it. Maybe he didn't. Maybe there's something that I'm missing. That could be the case as well. Of course, he can block with two Scrib Sprites and a giant growth. But is that really something to be afraid of? Not blocking right now. And is he going to pump the whelp? Actually re reading the dragon whelp now, making it into a 5-3. So dragon whelp, the way it works, you can uh, pay one red to give it plus one plus oh, and you can do that with three red max. If you pump it more than with three red, so let's say you put four or five red mana into it, uh, it does give, get the bonus, so it would turn into a 7-3, but at the end of turn, it dies. So that's kind of the consequence. And here we see an attack by the Elvish Archer. And unfortunately, Hank is not blocking. I would have loved to see uh, a Giant Grove on the Elvish Archer killing a Sheevan Dragon, but Hank is not doing it. So he is on 10 right now. I wonder what he's going to do. Deciding to swing in here with the Sheevan. And he can pump the Sheevan considerably. That's what he's doing, pumping it to nine. That means he's gonna fall to six life. Things are looking very dire here for Richard. Probably Richard is gonna attack. I'm a little bit surprised that he's not chump blocking with the script sprites. Then again, he doesn't have to yet. He can always do that next turn. And look at that, he's picking up his cards. Ah, man. 
He could have survived another turn. He could have given it a try. Deciding not to here. It is Hank who is winning this matchup. One against two. They're discussing the Dragon Whelp. Really nice to see both of these decks. Thank you, Hank and Ishad, for sharing this game with us. Uh, let me know, like I said, in the deck tech, let me know what would be your preference. The um, Fire Elemental or the Dragon Whelp, which one would you pick in this specific brew? I'd also like to thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you like to support the channel, you can do that by leaving a like. Uh, you can leave a comment. You can share this video on your socials and, of course, become a sub if you're not a subscriber yet. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can become a patron of the channel and you get you can become a sponsor of Timmy Talks. You can support what I do. So if you like this content, consider becoming a sponsor of the show and it already starts with $1 a month. You can click the info card that's appearing right now and that will explain uh, everything that you need to know about Timmy Talks on Patreon. Talking about Patreon, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at all the fantastic and amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazing.